blessed be God, most holy, glorious, and undivided Trinity. And blessed be God's reign now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us all say together the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, make us have perpetual love and reverence for your holy name, for you never fail to help and govern those whom you have set upon the sure foundation of your loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out the slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy and the angel of God called Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you Hagar? Do not be afraid for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Haran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Reading from Psalm 86. Bow down your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and in misery. Keep watch over my life, for I am faithful. Save your servant who puts his trust in you. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for you are my God. I call upon you all the day long. Gladden the soul of your servant. For you, for two, O Lord, lift up my soul. 
For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, and great is your love towards all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplication. In the time of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you. O Lord, no, nothing like your works. All nations you have made will come and worship you, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you are great, for you do wondrous things. You alone are God. Turn to me and have mercy upon me. Give your strength to your servant and save the child of your handmaiden. Show me a sign of your favor so that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, O oh Lord, have helped me and comforted me. A reading from the book of Romans. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by, baptize, by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, a disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? 
yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. Lord, open unto me. Open unto me light for my darkness. Open unto me courage for my fear. Open unto me hope for my despair. Open unto me peace for my turmoil. Open unto me joy for my sorrow. Open unto me strength for my weakness. Open unto me wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me love for my hates. Open unto me thyself for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me. Amen. That is a prayer written by Howard Thurman, a theologian, pastor, mystic, and educator who served as Martin Luther King Jr.'s intellectual mentor. It seems very appropriate for this moment in the life of our nation and our world, and very appropriate for today's gospel reading with Jesus' troubling words. Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. And he didn't stop there. Jesus said, choose me over your family, lose your life. For those of us who look to Jesus as the Prince of Peace, today's gospel reading might come as a bit of a shock. Instead of peace, Jesus seems to embrace violence. He comes with a sword to divide families, to set father against son, mother against daughter. His words seem to run against his teaching to love your enemies and turn the other cheek. What are we to make of all this? Well, we could go the Enlightenment route. In the 1700s, philosophers and theologians began interrogating biblical texts in a way never seen before, questioning supernatural accounts of miracles and teachings that seemed irrational. Thomas Jefferson edited his very own version of scripture to fit his values, literally cutting and pasting with razor and glue. The French thinker Voltaire employed his famous sardonic wit instead of a blade, writing a meditation in his philosophical dictionary in which he encounters Jesus and asks him some questions that are on his mind, like, did you not say once that you were to come, that you come not to send peace, but a sword? To which Jesus replied, it is a copyist's error I told them that I sent peace and not a sword. If only we could chalk it up to a copyist's error. But we also find a similar saying in the Gospel of Luke. So what is he saying? What is the good news? To understand what's going on here, it's important to unpack the context of the scripture. Matthew's Gospel is directed to a community of Jews in turmoil and conflict. Jesus' message that the kingdom of heaven was very near, indeed that the kingdom was even within the human heart, was controversial because it challenged the power of the religious establishment. Those who chose to follow Jesus were put at odds with family and community. They were neither part of the establishment nor were they members of the zealots, those who wanted to violently overthrow the Roman occupation. They followed another way, and there was nothing easy about this. Following Jesus was a very costly thing to do for the early disciples. 
Jesus's vision was for all people. And that message was a source of division for those who, for example, did not think it was appropriate for a religious teacher to dine with sinners and to consort with the very Romans who colonized the Jewish homeland and with the hated tax collectors who collaborated with the Roman occupation. But Jesus called out hypocrisy when he saw it. It's not just tax collectors who collaborated with the empire. The very religious establishment that criticized him helped maintain the peace with Rome. Now, Jesus was not a zealot and did not seek the violent overthrow of the Roman occupation. But I believe that when he said he came not to bring peace, but a sword, he was thinking of that celebrated Roman peace, the Pax Romana. The Romans brought relative stability to the Mediterranean region, but this peace was a false one because it was maintained by brutal violence and by the threat of violence. And this was known all too well to the Jewish people who saw their sons crucified as punishment for rioting against Rome. When Jesus initially called the disciples, it was a simple invitation. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. And at first, they were mostly students, learning at his feet and watching him perform miracles. But beginning in this chapter, we read today, Matthew shows us something that changes. The disciples move from being students to being sent forth into the world to do the work. Jesus sends them out to cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, to be about the work of ministry, to be about the business of partnering with God in the liberating work of rescuing and redeeming humankind. Jesus tells them, the student is not greater than the teacher, the servant is not greater than the master. In other words, make my priorities your priorities. But in doing so, he also warns them that they will meet resistance. But in the face of that, Jesus says to them, do not be afraid. Fear prevents stepping out in faith. Yes, they would face powerful opposition, but God would be with them. And then he says those perplexing words, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. If this troubles us, we need to ask ourselves what kind of peace Jesus was not bringing. Was it the peace of the world he and his disciples knew in first century Palestine? The peace of Pax Romana achieved by brutal force and assisted by collaboration with imperial occupation? No. God's peace is a world in which righteousness, justice, and love reign. True peace requires the realignment of priorities and relationships. That doesn't mean that Jesus exhorts his disciples to abandon family and community commitments, but rather to see all of these relationships through the lens of building the kingdom of heaven on earth, of healing the world and remaking it in the image of God that creation was intended to be. Jesus did not come to bring peace that is just the maintenance of the status quo, often in the service of oppression. Instead, he came to bring true peace, a peace that is built on his proclamation of the kingdom of God, a vision of the world remade in the divine image, one in which all people are seen as children of God. Jesus did not seek to divide people, but he knew that those who stood up for his message of love, compassion, forgiveness, of a truly just and peaceful world, he knew that they would face opposition. That is the baptism to which he was calling his followers, to proclaim the kingdom of God, even when it causes division, because the good news of the kingdom is the only way to build a truly just and peaceful world. The zealots wanted justice without peace. They risked bringing down the wrath of Rome on the Jewish people. The religious establishment and the Roman occupation wanted peace without justice. They wanted to maintain the status quo, which meant maintaining their power. But Jesus said there's another way, proclaiming the kingdom of God. In the vision of the kingdom, as Martin Luther King Jr. would say, there is no justice without peace and no peace without justice. 
One of the great problems facing our nation is that we have trouble linking peace with justice. Two days ago, our nation observed the 155th anniversary of Juneteenth, sometimes called Emancipation Day. On June 19, 1865, at the conclusion of a civil war that left over 600,000 people dead, peace was finally at hand, and the abolition of slavery became effective in all the former states of the Confederacy. Confederate forces had surrendered in Virginia in April, but the news did not reach Texas until two months later when Union troops arrived in Galveston Bay. On June 19th, General Gordon Granger read order number three. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. And yet Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation that General Granger referenced had only freed enslaved persons in the states in rebellion. Several Union states continued to enslave people until the end of the war. The peace was not yet just. Slavery even persisted in two Union states until months after the end of the war, when the 13th Amendment was ratified in December 1865. Slavery was ended for most in the United States by June 19, 1865, but it was not truly abolished until it was abolished everywhere in the nation. And even then, the promise of abolition had not been realized. When Reconstruction became a political liability and the freed people endured decades of terror at the hand of Jim Crow laws and lynch mobs, there was no peace for them, and there was certainly no justice. And even to this day, the achievements of the civil rights era and the advancements that we've made in recent decades are not enough. There's still deep inequality along racial lines. After declaring the enslaved peoples free, the second line of General Granger's Juneteenth order read, this involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property. Yet, we still do not have absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property in the United States. Until that is true, we as a nation and as a people are not truly free and our peace is not just. Recently, Michelle Alexander wrote in the New York Times, our only hope for our collective liberation is a politics of deep solidarity rooted in love. If we understand politics, in the classical philosophical sense of the affairs of the community, then I can affirm this statement as true to the Christian hope and mission. God calls us into the body of Christ, and as that body, we are called to be in solidarity with the world as we seek to transform it into the image of God, who is love. One of the ways we are in solidarity with the world is by treating our neighbors equally, by practicing justice. And now I want to tell you where I find the really good news in today's gospel. It's when Jesus says these words, nothing is, nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. We are called to proclaim the good news of God's kingdom of peace with justice and justice with peace. Don't whisper it, proclaim it, and it will set you free, and it will set our world free. The kingdom of heaven is a realm of emancipation. On Juneteenth, the message rang out that all the slaves are free. The next sentence held that this involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property. May we continue the work of making those statements true in every respect as we seek our collective liberation. This is the work of the church to set the world free so that we can truly live as children of God made in the image of love. That is our proclamation. That is our emancipation. To conclude, I want to once again offer Howard Thurman's prayer for our lives, our community, our nation, and our world. Lord, open unto me. Open unto me light for my darkness. Open unto me courage for my fear. 
Open unto me hope for my despair. Open unto me peace for my turmoil. Open unto me joy for my sorrow. Open unto me strength for my weakness. Open unto me wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me love for my hates. Open unto me thyself for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me. Amen. Let us now say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to God. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our bishop, and for all the clergy and people, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the <clears throat> aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all whose lives are closely linked with ours, especially those we name either silently or aloud. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our, our prayer. For all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially those we name either silently or aloud. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray to you, O Lord. For Lord, all the departed, for all the departed, especially those we name either silently or aloud. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And so, by your grace, in communion with the Blessed Mary, the God-giver, and all our saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. 
to you, O Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where in the Holy Trinity you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Good morning, and welcome to Trinity Church's online worship. Um, I would like to invite you to uh, join our online coffee hour. Um, that is at 1130 on Sundays. Sorry, 11, um, 11 on Sundays. And um, you may contact um, our parish administrator, Jill, um, at jill at trinitynj.com for more details on that. Or you can check the newsletter also. If you receive that. If you're not our newsletter, um, let us know and we'll add you to it. Um, and if you're a newcomer who's just joining us for the first time or first few times on these online services, um, let us know and uh, we can get you added to our system and let you know uh, more about Trinity Church. Uh, I also want to invite you to a new um, worship opportunity. Um, Wednesdays at six o'clock, we're going to begin an online service of evening prayer, and that's going to be over Zoom. And so uh, check your newsletter for details on that and how to get the link. Um, or you can email either me or Jill about that. Um, I invite you to um, continue supporting Trinity Church through your gifts. We're so grateful for them. They can allow us to do um, you know, a lot of good work in the community and to continue our work as a church in other ways. And uh, you can make your donations online. There's a tab that says giving on the webpage, or you can mail checks in to the church. Thank you all for joining us today. Let us remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. We're going to now participate in the Holy Communion by spiritual communion. And so I invite everyone to participate in that.
and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Glory and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk and love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you gave it to them and said, drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts that they may be the body and blood of Christ, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with the ever blessed Virgin Mary and all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them spiritually in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Now let us pray 
our post-communion prayer and thanksgiving. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.